Joshua chapter 6. Well, as we do each week, let's first review. We have crossed over the Jordan, and we had this incredible task in order to get out of the wilderness. And God brought us out to do what? To bring us in. God brought us out to bring us in into the promised land. And so, so many Christians, they've prayed the sinner's prayer to be brought out, but they have forgotten to say, God, but you want to bring me in to blessing. And so some of you, you're like straddling. You're not understanding why. Hey, I prayed the prayer. I got the baptism. How come my life is still crazy? Well, maybe because all you've done is to be brought out of Egypt, but you have yet to cross out of that wilderness. You're still eating manna, which is wilderness food, and you've yet to understand that the milk and honey is what God has to provide when we're walking in his blessing, when we're in the place of blessing. And that is found in obedience. And so as the people finally take the step of obedience, they have the Ark of the Covenant in the middle within them, and now they march across, and they get to the other side. Does God say, okay, great, charge? No. We learned in chapter 5 that when they get across the other side, what did God say? Worship. Yes, worship. First you get there, and in every little step, we want you to begin to pause and to worship. And we saw that there was, in fact, four ways in which God wanted us to be worshiped. Look at your notes. Pull them out. The first one they were to do was to worship how? In remembrance. Worship in remembrance. And so they were to do what? Remember the standing stones and to set those up and so that the families would see and go, Daddy, what is this? Hey, we want to let you know this is what God did. The waters just completely stopped. But you know what we had to do, son? We had to step in the water first. And so, my daughter, understand that there's going to be times when God's going to say go and we're going to say, but he hasn't show. That's okay. We go and then he will show. Amen? And so they're to stop and to remember. Then the second was what? Renunciation. You see, folks, there was some house cleaning that needed to be done. There needed to be some purification. And what was it? It was circumcision. In those 40 years, they had set aside something that seemed meaningless. They didn't get the point. But um, bum psh. All right. And so they had set it aside. They had forgotten it. But what they had sacrificed was what? What did I show you? What needs to happen before? Without circumcision, there is no Passover. And so for 40 years... 40 years, because of their own unbelief, what did they do? They had sacrificed their privileges and their blessings of worship. Has that been us? Have we sacrificed our, our privileges and blessings of worship? You see, we are such in a hurry to do something for God, but God has it this way. We first wants us to be something for him. And what is that? It's obedient. It's obedient, and that's what God is calling for us to be. And so we have to be, renounce the things in our life that are compromised so that we can worship. And some of you, you're coming and you're singing and your hands are up, but you know that you're singing songs and their words and it's melody, but there isn't this connection between your toes to the kingdom. And that's because there's stuff blocking, and Isaiah tells us that in 59. And I'm just praying for you tonight that you would understand that let's first remember what he has done, what Calvary is, what the cross has done for me, and then renounce in my life the nonsense. And then the third thing we have is what? Restoration. See, it's not about what I got to give up. No, no, no. God says, let's take out this wound. Let's take out this infection so that I can heal. And I want to restore into your life. And so I want to bring back what the locust has taken. And then worship number four in... Revelation. And that is where we end it off and that is where we pick up. Because now as he has worshipped the Lord in these three, now the leader Joshua takes a walk. He's looking at Jericho, sizing up the job. And what does he see? He sees an angel of the Lord standing there with the sword already drawn. And so he sees this divine being and I love this. And that's what I said last time. Is you know that this brother is from Papa Kalea. Because he walks right up to him and goes, what? Like fight. He goes, hey, are you for me or are you against me? What is this? And so he comes right up and calls him out. And he says, I am neither. I am the captain of the, whole, the, Lord, the Lord's host. What does that mean? As I showed you, that that's a theophany. That is Jesus Christ. And so here we have him coming before the very presence of God. And he falls down and he worships because he understands who he is. And so there he begins to do what with Joshua? He reminds Joshua who was going to do this and who was with him. You see, as Gehazi needed to see and have his eyes opened up that the chariots of the Lord were all around them, he was saying, Joshua, you're not alone. God is with you and he's going before you. It is he that is going to do the work. And so both leader and the people needed to recognize their dependence upon God. If you didn't write that down, write it again. Before they moved forward, it was critical to God that both leader and people recognized their dependence upon God. As I said on Monday, why do we got mud in our eye? Because when there's mud in our eye, where do we run? Water. To the water. And who's the water? 
Jesus, the living water. And so do we recognize our dependence upon God? And some of us tonight, we're, have, we're all beat up and scarred and tired and exhausted. Why? Because we've been battling a battle that we weren't even supposed to battle. Because the battle belongs to the Lord. And so our dependency has to be upon God. And when we forget that, then we find ourselves wounded. And that is why 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now, tonight we are going to see the very, 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 very famous story about Jericho and the walls coming down. All kinds of songs being sung about it. Veggie Tales even has a whole thing about it. Bruce comes up and hands me a DVD and says, you got to watch the Veggie Tales. It's hysterical, the little French peas and everything. <laughs> and so I stick it in, and I begin to watch this thing, and i got to confess, I'm like, I'm feeling old because I'm not laughing. <laughs> and then it finally gets to the good part where it comes to the wall, and they're marching around the wall, and the first brick goes to go like this, and all of a sudden the CD goes, Fit! and it stopped. I'm like, no! <laughs> I just wasted 15 minutes on VeggieTales and I didn't even get, oh, it was, it was horrible. <laughs> and then I figured my elder was pulling a prank on me and he knew it did that. But nonetheless, something that we have to understand before we even get into this story is this, guys. Jordan represented a victory. Are you with me? Okay, Jordan, the false gods, and the false gods were defeated by the true and only living God. And so they crossed the Jordan. And I just need you to tell this tonight. I have found, I have noticed in my own life and in 27 years of ministry that after every Jordan, there seems to be a Jericho. After you got a Jordan, yoo-hoo, there's a Jericho, a fortress right in front of you. And that's what we want to look at tonight. We have to understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the trials that they're going through are the same trials that we're going through. And so often the enemy gets us so isolated saying, oh, only you, only you. When in reality, listen, they've just crossed the Jordan. But what's next? A Jericho. And let me just give you a little example of this. As again, many of you know that my dad was... uh, um, a part-time archaeologist, the, he did a lot of study in the early years with Catherine Kenyon and the understanding of Jericho and at the dig, and I went to, to Jericho many times. As they've begun to look at the city, there's a couple amazing things that as they look at the foundations of the city, that there were two walls, not one, but two walls. The one wall, the outer wall, was six feet by 30 feet, so six feet wide, 30 feet tall, and then as you came back up the, 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 the hillside towards the city itself, then there was a second wall 12 feet wide by 30 feet tall. So they were able to ride chariots across the top of the wall with horses and to be able to fortify their city. This was not this your neighbor's fence kind. Okay? Two huge 6 foot by 30 foot and then 12 foot by 30 foot walls that they're able to find. Now, this is my favorite little nugget, which I'm just getting off course, but it is so fun. When the, 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 the archaeologists first came through and started digging, they found it from the Hasmonean period. They found it from this period. They found it from this period. They found all the different walls, except they couldn't find any evidences of the walls of Jericho's period. And so they were saying, ha-ha, look, here we go. Once again, we're able to show, look, the Bible says something, but we can't find it archaeologically. Um, time out. What does it say It happened when God destroyed it? He destroyed it. No wonder you can't find it. Because when God takes care of business, he takes care of business. business. Amen? <laughs> it's like, hello. But they can see the foundations, and they continue to always build upon one after another. And so my point is, is that with the seemingly impenetrable, the seemingly not possible, this fortress is what's before them. And I don't know what your Jericho is tonight. And I know it may seem huge and large. And how can I get past the city? How can I get through this state? How can I tell with my ex? How can I deal with this? Whatever this monstrous wall is in front of you, bitterness, hatred, unforgiveness, all these things, this Jericho, understand that the people tonight are also looking at a fortress that's bigger than they. But God is large and in charge. charge. Verse 1. Now Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. Stop right there. The Bible says in Matthew 16, it says that my church, if we will confess that Jesus is Lord, that's the foundation of his church and and the gates of hell will not prevail. Folks, we need to understand which one's in hell, which one's in the gate. Hell, okay? Understand this. So here we see, look, it says, now here's this 
big city. But notice, who's the one that's bound back? Who's the one? That, it's the Jericho. The people of Jericho are the ones that are being held back because they recognize there's something mighty about this God that is with these people. And the same thing with Satan. He is scared to death, and that is why he's trying to freak us out and take our mind off the truth that will set us free tonight. Now, Jericho was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out, no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, stop right there. When did the Lord say this to Joshua? Well, if you go back to chapter 5, it's when he's having this conversation with him. And so remember, we're the ones that put the chapters and verses in there. So now he's coming along and the Lord is saying to him, hey, I am the captain of the Lord of hosts. So for now he goes on. And the Lord said to him, what does he say to him? He says, see, I have given you. Would you circle, underline, highlight that? See, I have given you. Now you smart kind people who took the English classes. What tense is this? Okay. Just jot that down. Pass. Now I noticed all my local guys were looking at me going, huh? How come you know go call? Because I stay calm in already. We don't know our tenses. All right, now. See, I have given, past tense, I have given Jericho into your hand when it's king and the valiant warriors. Oh, excuse me, with its king and its valiant warriors. Verse 3, you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. Now, you guys remember when we were in Genesis, I showed you, or had you listen to the Bill Cosby version of Noah, remember? That's what's running through my mind right now. Here's the angel of the Lord standing over the sword. And so he's speaking to him and says, hey, you know, I am not for you, against me. I'm the angel of the Lord, so the host, and this is what you should do. You should recognize your dependence upon the Lord God Almighty. Okay, and this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to march the entire nation around the city for six days. Right. <laughs> I mean, he's just like, I, I, right. This is what you're supposed to do. See, my point that I want you to start is this. Once again, God does not make sense. God does not make sense. What do I mean? Well, first of all, he's talking past tense of a future event. It hasn't even happened yet, but God's like, done deal. Can I just tell you tonight that's the same thing with your life? It's already a done deal. Book of Revelation, I'm going to really mess with your head. The book of Revelation is not prophecy. It's history. It already happened. That's why he can give you so much detail. Because for us, time is linear. For God, time is nonlinear. Here's Moses. Here's you and me. Revelation, all same time. Because he's here. We're going across. Like an ant crawling across the table. Well, you see here and you see where he's going. You see it all at one time. But that little bugger, he can only cruise one second at a time. And so, God is speaking past tense of a future event. And so, he is doing that because, again, he is large and... Okay, we're going to get this as pounded in our heads tonight. Now, what does he want? All he wants him to do is march around the city six days. No, there's more. Verse 4. And also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of the ram's horn before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city... How many, you want to guess? Seven times. Seven times and the priest shall blow the trumpets. Notice how God likes the number seven. Now why? What is the number seven? Yeah, perfect completion. You need to jot that down. It is that perfection, that perfect completion. And so is he just randomly? No. Every single Israelite is understanding why. On the seventh day, in the seventh time, in the seventh trumpets, he's saying, I'm going to do a perfect work. And dear one, tonight, if I could just grab you by the ears and look you in the face, I could just share with you and say, he is going to do a perfect work in you as well. He who began the work is faithful to complete it. Learn it, know it. Hmm. Oh, tonight, this message, I'm just going to have this as a CD, and from now on, when someone comes for counseling and therapy, I'm just going to hand them the message. Here you go. <laughs> this is what he's saying to us. He says, listen, I do my work perfectly. My timing is perfect. Guess what? It will not make sense to you. But you're not God. And I tell you what, I don't want that job. Anybody? I don't want that job although I seem to try for it all the time. Verse 5. It shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, 
And now what are these ram's horns and these trumpets? Just jot this down somewhere. Those are instruments of worship. Okay, when you hear these instruments of worship, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the walls of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. Now, because you've heard this story since Sunday school, you're like reading with me, you're like going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, let's go back. First time you've ever heard it. Okay, Joshua, here's the plan. God is telling you. God's plan? Walk around it six days. But on the seventh day, he's like, okay, good, good, good. On the seventh day, you're going to do it seven times. And you're going to say nothing the entire time, every time you go on. But the last time, you're going to shout. And when you shout, the wall's going to fall down. Right. I mean, come on. Think about it. Are you, are you, is anyone here in military? Military? Anybody? Yeah? Can, your, your commander says, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go into Kabul, and we're going to march around it, and we're going to go, Aah! and the whole city's going to fall down. And the entire Al-Qaeda is going to go, we give up, we give up, we give up. <laughs> and I'm your general, and I just told you, here's the plan. You guys are going to be like, okay, some of you know. <laughs> what makes us think they're any different than us today? They know what battle looks like, and it doesn't look like... What about when God said, hey, I got a plan for you. You know what? It's called virginity. And so you hold on to that because that you can buy other things in Target, but you can't buy virginity. And so I got this gift for you to give to a loved one so the rest of your life you'll have this very precious, intimate gift of the two. <laughs> I thought it would make sense because what, 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 how do you know? And you've heard me talk about this subject so many times. And yet it seems to be constantly still a problem because I constantly still hear about people in the body of Christ living together, sleeping together, whatever, and missing because it just doesn't make sense. And then they bond themselves in a way that does not have the platform that God has provided called marriage, and then they wonder why their stool, because their pyramid is this way rather than this way. And all the things about finances and tithing. Oh, it's tithing, it's, it's an Old Testament principle, it's not a New Testament principle. Really, is that's probably why you don't have a job right now. That's probably why you're in debt. It's probably why you're struggling. Well, I mean, how can you do that? Da, da, da. Hey, listen, it's the only time in the Bible when God says, test me in this, dear ones. So if you make $10 a month and your rent is $800 a month, I would still say tithe that 10% and let God provide. It's his word. It's his job. Let him keep his word. Amen? And I'll talk to anybody who wants to talk about whether you think it's whatever relevance, but you will see it throughout the New Testament. I always find those that are grumbling about it are those who are not walking in the blessing of it. Now notice here, God is saying here, I want you to march around the city and those walls are going to fall down. Verse 6, so Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, hey guys, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests carry seven trumpets of a ram's horn before the Ark of the Lord. Right. Now, God's got a pretty powerful thing going. But what's the first thing that he says here? God says, lift me up. I am going to do a work, listen, before you but I want you to lift me up and worship. I want you to get the priest. I want you there right in the front. I want that worship right in front. I want these seven horns. I want these brothers there, and I want you to lift me up and worship. Now, how are they supposed to worship? Well, it's actually there in verse 7. Take a look. Then he said to the people, what's it say? Underline, circle, highlight, smiley face, whatever you need to do. Then he says to the people, go forward and march around the city and let the armed men go on before the ark of the Lord. How does God want his people to worship? How does he want them to lift him up? To go forward. To go forward. Now, I know it's going to be kind of hard for some of you over there, but listen to me. For the sake of time, I was going to have you turn there, but let me read these. Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. Jot it down. Exodus 14, 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to what? 
Go forward. Jeremiah 7.24. Jeremiah 7.24. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and in their stubbornness of their evil heart and went backwards, not what? forward. Philippians 3.13 Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do. Hey, I'm not there yet. I don't have everything that God has made me to be yet, but there's one thing I do. Forget what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. This is not an isolated point. God is saying to you tonight, brother, sister, how many times I already tell you, it's time to go forward. Take that step of faith. Remember Indiana Jones? And he sat there and saw the cliff, and oh, there was that whole gap, and I showed you that, that whole illustration, and here he's supposed to go, and uh, there's no way he can leap from this side to that side, and all he sees is the endless drop, and yet he looks at the book, and it says, unless you take a step of faith, and he looks down, and it's impossible, but who wrote the book? His father. And because his father was right about that trial, and his father was right about this trial, then Indiana finally just says, you know what? I gotta go forward and he takes that step and once he stepped he saw the entire path and I just sat there in church I mean in, in the theater and went oh, oh, oh. <laughs> that's Christianity <laughs> you take that step forward and all of a sudden the Lord shows you and oh my goodness my wife and I look back and we go oh my goodness look how God was here and he was here and he was here and we were clueless when we were there but we were going forward he says to you, why? Why are you standing still? Why are you going backwards? I want you to move forward with what I have already shown you. Now, I love this because he tells them, this is what I want you to do. I want you to march around the city. I want you to take the trumpets. You're going to be silent. You're going to do all these things. And then God is going to do these amazing things. So go forward. Chapter, verse 8, powerful four words. And it was so. Now, I didn't look up in the King James, Aaron Tozer, what does it say there? What was it, how's it start, a verse? And it came to pass, and it came to pass, and it was so. Underline that, circle that, highlight that. Why? Because there is your difference between a generation 40 years ago and them. A generation 40 years ago were told a crazy thing, go, and I'm going to give you to giants. And they said, <laughs> and they went the other direction. They didn't go forward. And so for that reason, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years because of unbelief. They looked at the size of the giants rather than the size of their God. Are you tonight going to see big fruit or big giant when you leave this building? That's what you're going to have to understand. Hey, big fruit, big God, he's a giver, he's a papa who wants to dote on me, his kid, or big giants. And you see here, this generation, just as crazy a plan, maybe even crazier, but it says, and it was so. Amen? I want you tonight, when you go to bed, say, Lord, whatever it is that you're calling me, you're calling me in the ministry, out of ministry, to turn left or to turn right, to do this, to sacrifice, to give, whatever it is, Lord, may I say, may it be so, and it be so, and someone would say of me, and it was so. So that we can walk in the blessing. Amen? All right, now, and it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of the ram's horn before the Lord went, what? Oh, come on. This is being taped. Make them look like you're paying attention. <laughs> and they went, forward. awesome. Yeah, see, they're here. Okay, they went forward. And they blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. Now notice. And the armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came after the ark while they continued to blow the trumpets. Now, where's the ark then? Ah, central. We talked about it on Sunday. We talked about it two weeks ago. Center. Jesus, be the center. Is he central? The ark is where it is. And so when the ark is centered in your life, everything else around it is going to find itself, finding itself in place. Now, I got a question. Anybody here blow trumpet? Like you play trumpet, you're a trumpet player. Raise your hand, come on. Okay, you, you trumpet player? Okay, come on up here, come on up here. All right. 
Because here is the ram's horn. This is what they were blowing, not that little silver thing that you think, you know. So, good luck, baby. Try and blow it. It's clean right now, so then we'll wipe it out for Brian. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. All right. Okay, buddy. Give it a shot, baby. Now, now do it. Nice. Now, just awesome. Now, my turn. Psych. No, okay, now, you guys can sit down. Can you imagine that noise? The th And it's just going around your city and no one's saying anything. You can imagine the people of Jericho are going, what's going on? God is into psychological warfare. I love it. And you know what? God wants to psych out the enemy right now too. He wants to psych him out in your faith and saying, I'm going to believe in God. And when God says, I have a purpose and a plan for your life, and your friends say, brother, let's go drink, let's go do the climb, go do this, take the butt, we go here, we can do this stuff. And you're saying, nah, I don't need to do that. God's got such a better place for me. Oh, how are you ever going to meet a girl? How are you ever going to meet a man? You got to go down clubbing with us. We need to blow the trumpet of faith, amen? amen? And so that is, maybe you guys can make CDs or something, I don't know, you know. We can have these two guys blow on it all night, you can make CDs and you can rock it in your car. Hey, what you doing? I've been faithful, brah. <laughs> I'm obeying the Lord. Okay, verse 10. So they're having these trumpets blow, but it says, but Joshua commanded the people, underline, highlight, commanded the people saying, you shall not Shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you. Shout, then you shall shout. Now notice with me, church, he did not tell them why or really anything much but to march, follow the ark, and keep quiet. Isn't that ironic that that is probably the hardest command we can be told? <laughs> Come on, be honest, amen? amen? Shut it! This is what you're doing. This is what I want you to do. I wonder how many times God has had to do that with us and say, listen, that's probably the most difficult thing for us to do is to listen and obey and not to speak. But you see, we here in Hawaii, we have this epidemic it's called Niele. <laughs> Maha oi. Oh, what's going on over there? Oh, who's she saying? Oh, she's saying. Oh, look who's she's staying. Oh, oh, I think they're dating. You know, oh no. <laughs> they get on Maha oi, get on Niele. Like, oh, what is this? We get, we want to know. There's something in us that wants to know. But you know what God is saying? I'm going to ask you to do some crazy things in life, and I want you to go forward, and I'm saying this in love, and shut up. Just go forward and trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Now, why, why, why do we know these verses when yet have such a crazy month? Because we were doing everything backwards than what the Lord is showing right here. He is the same yesterday. He says, serve me in your silence. Just jot down Ecclesiastes 3 and read it later. There is a time for everything, a time to speak and a time to be silent, a time to gather stones, a time to throw stones. There's a time. And when God tells you to be silent and don't go get in your sister's face, he means it. And when he says it's time to go speak and to share with your sister that she's stumbling, he means it. So now he says this, verse, 14, verse 11. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city, circling it once, 
Then they came into the camp and spent the night at the camp. I'm just wondering what the people in Jericho are tripping by now. Now Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of the ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets. Oh, I'm just loving it. I'm just hearing it. And just all of them, just seven guys just going around like, ah! They blew continually, underlined, and blew the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, and the rear guard came after them. And while they continued to blow the trumpets. Folks, having somebody, and some of you guys here in the military, and you know, and some of you that have been in boxing or any of these other kinds of contact sports, the wondering what you're going to do is far more brutal than actually what you're going to do. And so you delay it as long as you can. I was a youth pastor for 22 years. I would sometimes have, not exaggerating, 200 junior hires and me because they wouldn't show up. My, my, every single guy would call, hey, I can't come, and I'm like, great. And that was the night we had a Mac crowd. And that is when I learned the power of this one. Smack! And the kids would be all, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I was going to pack and attack the kid. And they're like, oh, well, you can't do that. Why? <laughs> Playing with them. But you see, I learned that, hey, what am I going to do? I don't know. What it, and then I'd be like looking at them. When you're teaching and junior hires are going crazy, you don't go, guys, 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 guys. And you just stop and go. Like, oh, shut up, bro, shut up, Mac. What's this mad? He's mad, he's mad, mad. And they sit down like, oh, he's going, I don't know what he's going to do, but he's just not doing it anymore. <laughs> and you just got to psych. And God, maybe he's been psyching you, bringing you to that repentance, maybe the mud in the eye, to say, listen, get back to the plan, get back to the purpose, and allow God to put whatever he's going to do in the hearts of the enemies because they're trapped in their buildings, they're freaking out. And yet, here's Israel thinking, this is impossible for us, and yet it's the Jerichoites. These are the ones that are in bondage. Folks, it's your friends who are asking you to go to sin, to compromise. That lady at work that's saying, have an affair with me, she's the one in bondage. And understand this. And we need to blow the trumpet of our life. Verse 14, and thus on the second day, they marched around the city, and once they returned to the camp, they did so for six days. Then, verse 15, on the seventh day, they rose early at the dawning of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day, they marched around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, when the priests blew the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord, please underline, has given you the city. Two things I need you to know. Number one, notice again, the tense is what? It's past tense. And secondly, the word is given. Let me explain. First of all, I find it interesting that one of the earliest commandments God gave his people is that we're supposed to work on the sixth, six days. We're supposed to work six days. We're supposed to go around and round and round on the merry-go-round for six days. But on the seventh day, the seventh day is to be consecrated where the people get together and they shout to the Lord. They shout unto him. They shout unto his praises. They act in obedience and proclaim the Lord. And I still believe that God wants us to gather together on that seventh day and shout. And what are we supposed to shout? Why do we gather to shout? We come and shout and say, the Lord has given us the city. And when we gather together, when Matt and the team begin to hit that first chord, whether it be a Wednesday night or on a Sunday, but in my illustration of the seventh, when that chord begins to hit, we are saying the Lord has given us the city. Past tense of a future event. Amen? Okay, now let me show you why. You're looking at me kind of like going, all right, that's cool. Chill out. Why are you so hyped? Okay, Gary, I know you don't like to be embarrassed, but would you just stand up for a second? <laughs> I, don't, I don't do them anyways, eh? Okay, I don't think as I'm looking around, Cindy, why don't you stand up, please? Out of this entire room here tonight, there's two people here that were part of the six people who heard this sermon in January of 2005 when we started this church. There were six people 
sitting on the steps at Orvis that heard this message, and he is one of them, and my wife is another one. And my point is, I said to them then, you remember, because you said your Bible's got all the notes in it, I said these exact words. We are to get together and shout because the Lord has given us the city. And there's six of us. <laughs> and they're looking at me going, you're nuts. And tonight, three locations later, where we've been, you may be seated, thank you. Three locations later, another facility here, God has blessed us with this, this service, that service, a TV station later, da 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 all the things that are going on, I'm sure those six people, including me, had no clue what Jesus was going to do. Amen? I mean, folks, do not underestimate. A church just said, we're done. Here, you take it. And handed us the keys of what God had through some people back in the 40s with their tithes and offerings, invested in the land, built a building, and said, we want the kingdom to be shouted and proclaimed in this place. And God has says, you know what? These people are doing it, so I'm going to give it to them. That is what God is doing. He is, wants us to get together and shout because we are to say God has given us Kaimuki. He's given us Manoa. He's given us Eva. He's given us Oahu. He's given us Hawaii. He's given us the world because God is large and And you see, if you don't really believe that, I just want to encourage you that you got to or you're in the wrong room. Because I want the people who want to walk around me to those who are going to say, I'm going to follow the trumpet. I'm going to have the ark centered in my life because I has not seen, ears not heard, mind hasn't even comprehended the glorious things he has. And some of us are sitting here tonight going, but I don't have a husband. I'm 42 and I don't have a wife. Where is God? Please, understand. Walk in obedience. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He is large and And so, God has given us the city. Amen? Amen? And it's not just us. It's the body of Christ. God has called us to be the light, to be the people here who are proclaiming the truth that will set People free. No weapon formed against us shall prosper, we just read. That's what it means when I say the Lord has given us. Why? Because if God is in me, he who is in me is greater than he's in the world. Then that means God has given me the city. If man is for me, if God is for me, whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation, the psalmist said. We need to stop cowering and start going. Which way? Forward. Forward. Verse 17 he says this now. Here's the key. God's given you the city. Shout. And so we get together and we shout, but here's a condition. The city shall be under the band. And it, and, excuse me, it and all, please underline, it and all that is in it belongs where? To the Lord. Only Rahab, the heart of it, and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you... Keep, please underline or highlight, yourselves. Keep yourselves. That means that's not pastor's job. That's not your parents' job. That's not your spouse's job. Whose job is it? Okay, keep yourselves. And so you're all supposed to say mine. Okay, you're telling it yours. No, it's not me and it's mine. <laughs> keep yourselves from the things under the band so that, then circle, you do not covet them. Keep yourselves from them so you don't covet them. You know, you set your eyes on things, you begin to start wanting things. And then you find yourself spending monies, and then when you're spending monies, then you don't have any monies when it comes time for God to do crazy and amazing things. You know, a couple Sundays ago, I mean, man, we had Sammy's ministry, we had the Gideon's ministry. I know we've got Kelsey who is dying because her body is shutting down and needs a surgery. I know at the same time... Um, uh, Corrine is battling with the cancer that's going on, and she's going to need surgery, and, and we have a hurricane in Japan. We have all these things, and we hear these needs, and someone says, hey, can you help? Can you help? And we're like, yeah, I would, but uh, I went to Costco last week, and I probably spent more than I should have. You see? 
keep yourself from the things in the ban so that you will not be tempted by them, so that you will not covet them. Some of you might get magazines and catalogs that get mailed to your house, and it's all about stuff. May I suggest you cancel that? Look at what God has blessed you with. Am I talking against being blessed by things? No, I'm not. I'm talking about what percentage of our gifts, our talents, our treasures are used on me versus what is free for me to do what God has called me to do. Now he says, do not covet them and take some of the things under the ban and make the camp of Israel accursed and bring trouble on it. Amazing. We're going to see next week exactly what happened. But he says, listen, when you sin, when you stumble, it has an impact on the community. Now some of you might be hearing God saying that and so you're going to go, oh, okay, I'm not going to go to church then because I don't want to hurt the folks that one love and right now I'm living in sin. Folks, it's not the church one love. It's the church at whole. It's the name of Jesus Christ and it's giving people a reason to blaspheme his name. And he says, do not allow this to bring a curse upon God's camp. Verse 19, but all the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and the iron, they are holy to the Lord, but they shall go into the treasury of the Lord. You see, what I'm saying is this. This is something that God's kids don't understand. We are to engage in action, yet not become entangled by the world that we're engaging. We are to engage in action, but not get entangled by the world in which we are engaging. You see, you've heard the term that we are to be in the world and not of the world. That's not a scripture, it's a principle in scripture. Basically, God is saying this. We are to be like a boat. A boat is made to be where? In the water, but you don't want the water in the boat. And some of you are wondering, how come I'm not just sailing by? <laughs> You're seeing a whole bunch of Christians going, choo-hoo, gunnels in the water, like, hey! And you're like, how come them? Have you looked at your water line? Have you let the things, the cares, the worries, the wants, the drama of the world to begin so that your boat is really only that far out of the water? He wants us to be in the world, but not of it. He wants the boat in the water, not the water in the boat. But for some reason, and I believe it's part of the John 10.10, I believe for some reason we are naturally attracted to the things that are harmful. Anyone agree with that? It starts with little ones. What do the two-year-olds go after? The knives. And you're like, ah! And you come and you carefully take it away from them and they're like, ah! And they're all mad at you. Well, guess what? Some of you tonight, you're with God. You're like, yeah, 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 with God. And God's like, hey, I took the knife out of your hand. You thought she was nice. You thought she was hot. You thought she was the one. She was a knife, and she was going to hurt you. You thought that job was what was going to provide for you everything you needed. But you know what? That job was going to provide for you in such a way you were going to forget me, and so I took it away from you. I put mud in your eye, brother, because I need you to run to the water. We're naturally attracted to things, and God is trying to warn his people, and you hear the secular world, they read this, and they're like, oh, how's your God? He goes out killing people and dying and destroying things and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> you obviously haven't spent any time in a nursery because you have to constantly be protecting them from themselves. And that is what God is doing to us. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He's out to make everything naughty look nice. And yet, it's not what your soul desires. Verse 20 goes on to say this. So, the people shouted. I love it. The people shouted. The priest blew the trumpets. And when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout. And the wall fell down flat. Loving it. So that the people went up into the city and every man straight ahead and they took the city. Amen? Now, at the end of the night, I want to know which one of you two guys want to do it, but when we're done, Matt, with everything in worship, I want us to be able to just take this thing and instead of me saying hide it under a bushel, we're just going to blow the trumpet, we're going to shout, and we're going to take the city. Amen? Amen. That's what we need to do. So I'm just going to put it right here so you don't forget. <laughs> Stay. Now, they went into the city. Would you underline it? They went up into the city. It's there in verse 20, the last part. 
The walls fell down and they went in. The point is, is that tonight he says, keep yourself from the band. And then when you see this, go forward. God is providing for you and I tonight, but it's up to us. It's our kul'ana, as we would say, to step in, to go into the battle, to go into the city, to harvest what God has provided for us. But then people have issues with verse 21. They utterly destroyed everything in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. Again, I have had a million people say, how's your God? How's that? All the killing. How come the God, the God in the Old Testament is different than the God in the New Testament? The God in the New Testament is all lovey-dovey and the God in the Old Testament, he's all killing all the time. He's all angry. And I got a set of scriptures that I pull out when someone says that and I'm like, really? You mean like this? This verse here about God bringing forth judgment and punishment and damnation and all these things about here and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now these ones here about grace and mercy and loving kindness and turning like, yeah. I said, you know what? All those ones about grace and loving kindness, those came out of the Old Testament. And all those ones about punishment and damnation, they came out of the New Testament. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is righteous, church. He is holy and he will not tolerate sin. And God has the right to punish sin. God has never nor will he ever kill an innocent. We have to understand that. We know that God knows everything. And so you sit there and go, oh, what about even the little one? Obviously the Lord knew the context and the content of where they were. How do I know that? Well, I wish I had a lot of time, but jot this down. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 and 5. Deuteronomy 4 and 5 says that God will strike the cities of Canaan because of their wickedness. So before we even got here, back in Deuteronomy 9, he says, listen, we're going to go in and because of their wickedness, why? Because they rebelled against God, meaning they had the choice. Choose me and live, choose your own rebellion and die. They chose their own rebellion. They mocked God and said, yeah, do whatever you can. Obviously, God had sent a prophet, God had sent someone, but we know that God is true to his word. Amen? And that is why Deuteronomy 20, verses 10 through 17, Deuteronomy 20, verses 10 through 17, say this, when you approach a city to fight against it, you shall offer it terms of peace. And it shall come about that if it agrees to make peace with you, open to you, you shall be that the people there who are found in it shall become and become your servants unto you. However, if it does not make peace with you and it makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. So the Lord said, listen, we're giving them a chance to repent. And so whether that's included here in this part of the story, no, but I know in Deuteronomy, that's exactly what God said. What's my point? When God punishes, God is going to punish, and he has every right to punish, because he alone is holy. Amen? And so when he's wiping things out here, you got to understand this. It's twofold. Jot this down. It is punishment, and it is prevention. Why the swiping out and the wiping out of entire cities? It is punishment. It is understanding that they chose to rebel against God. And secondly, it is prevention. God says, listen, you may say, well, I want to show mercy to these folks and I will just make them my servants instead. Well, in so doing, then what happens is that they begin to take their ways. You see, when we start turning a soft eye to sin, sin starts to look good. Any amens? It does. It does, it does, it does, it does. And God says, listen, there's going to be a day in the hour and I don't know who's listening tonight, but you understand that there is a day in the hour when God talks about the end of the world. <gasps> Did he say that? Is he one of those wackos? No, there is. There is. There's a day in the hour. There is a rapture. There is an Armageddon. I've been there. I go there all the time. I'll show you the field exactly where he says how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen. And he says the world's going to look like when it happens. And the world is incredibly looking like how the Bible says it's going to look in those days. Now, I don't spend as much time teaching on all that as a lot of my brothers do, and that's where, again, David has, I raised up David in that. David knows everything I know and then some on prophecy, and he puts the, these together these teachings and stuff. My purpose is I don't spend the time on Sundays and Wednesdays talking about all the end times events because I don't want you looking at the end times. I want you looking at the giver of all time. And so to me, right here and now, you and I need to know, but I am standing in front of you and saying that as I look at the world, when I look at the amount of earthquakes, and I look at the circumstances, when I see what's going on in our society, that now this coming September 11th, we cannot pray. It has been banned to pray at ground zero. Hmm. This year, there was a ban. Oh, wow, it was actually on, on, even in August. 
There was a law that was proposed that circumcision would be illegal. And the people who wrote the bill on circumcision being illegal said it was because of its cruel, inhumane practices. However, you look behind the guy who wrote the bill, you see that he has all kinds of characters mocking Jewish people and Jewish faith and Jewish customs. Interestingly enough, that I find that God are in this world that of all the different faiths and practices that religions have, that this one would be attacked in such a way that someone would try to make a bill that would make circumcision illegal when circumcision is a sign of the covenant between God and his people. Now, of course, today it's done for medical reasons and everything else, but the purpose of it, and I just thought, oh, wow, interesting. We live in days and times when right is wrong and wrong is right and things about here and there's constantly all these subtle attacks that you know what we can't pray in schools and I can't go in as a pastor and teach anymore in the schools but we can do this and that and all this other nonsense. All I'm trying to say is, is that punishment and prevention, God knows that when we partner with sin, sin will begin to show itself upon our lives. Verse 22, Joshua said to the two men who had the spies who spied out the land, go into the harlot's house and bring out the woman and all that she has out of here. As you had sworn to her, so the young men who were the spies went in and brought out Rahab and all of her father and her mother and her brothers and all that she had. And also brought out all of her relatives and placed them outside the camp of Israel. God was true and he protected them, folks. He is Jehovah Rapha. He is the provider. He says, I will provide for you. He did provide for her. Same for you and for me. Verse 24, they burned the city with fire and all that was in it, only the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. However, Rahab, the harlot, and her father's household and all that she had, Joshua spared. And she has lived in the midst of Israel to this day, for she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent out to spy out Jericho. Then Joshua made them take an oath at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord is the man who rises up and builds the city Jericho, and with the loss of his firstborn he shall lay its foundation, foundation, and with the loss of his youngest son he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Now, verse 26 is very interesting. Joshua says this city is under a curse. There was obviously a wickedness and a rebellion in that city that we know not, that the Bible did not take all the time to give us. Please look at me for a second, please. Understand that when you are getting details in the Bible, it's a snapshot. It's like a picture. Right now, with my finger as I'm making this tube, I can only see this section, and I can see about eight to ten people max. Does that mean you're not in the room? No. When you take a picture on a trip, all you get is the details. That doesn't show me everyone else that was around you and all this stuff. And so you're looking at the picture, and so you get these numbskulls who are going to say to you, where did Cain get his wife? It doesn't say anywhere else wrote all the other people. Hello, because it's talking about one family. The details on one family it never says, and these are the only people that ever existed at the point of this murder. No, it doesn't. So whatever the wickedness was in this city, it was so vile and so wretched that God says, this city is not to be rebuilt. And so I'm putting a curse on it. And curse to the firstborn and curse to the youngest, any who would rebuild this city. Well, I don't have the time, but underline or put in your margins right there, 1 Kings 16.34. Because in 1 Kings 16.34, there was a king who tried to set up Jericho. And you know what happened? When he began to build the city, his firstborn died. And when he put the gates on, his youngest died. Exactly as God said. 1 Kings 16.34. Well, our story ends tonight that the Lord is with Joseph, or Joshua, and his fame was in all the land. Joshua means what? God saves. God saves. Joshua is the name that we understand when we pronounce it Yeshua, which is the name we pronounce in English, Jesus. You see, how did these walls fall? Did they fall by cunning and power? No. How did they fall? The Bible tells us how they fell. In Hebrews chapter 11, look over on the screen. Hebrews 11, it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. What caused them to fall? Faith. Faith in whom? Faith in the giver of the plan. Jot that down, church. Faith in the giver of the plan. This is what I want you to do. March around the city six times and blow trumpets. Right. But that's exactly what happened. 
You see, this was a faith, but guys, it was a tested faith for sure. Tonight, God is bringing you to the point of understanding this issue, this Jericho in your life is bigger than you. Why hasn't God answered my prayer? Why hasn't he done this? Why is this? Because God wants you tonight to be convinced that you need Jesus. Amen? He needs for us to be convinced to have, as I said in the beginning, the utter dependency upon God. The problem tonight is that we're trying to share God's glory and he will not share his glory. The problem tonight is that we are trying to share God's authority and power and hey God, come on, help me out on this one. Why don't you back me up on this one rather than saying, Lord, I will go forward as the ark is the center of my life. The second reason that they were to march around this 13 times is number one, to be convinced that they couldn't do it themselves, that they needed Jesus, they needed Yeshua, they needed Joshua to lead them and God to provide for them. But secondly, they need to realize that Jericho was then going to be a gift. It was a gift. Twice in our text it says, I have given you. And as they marched around and says, this is impossible. There's no way. We're a bunch of shepherds and herdsmen. How are we going to defeat this city that has a 12-foot by 30-foot wall and a 6-foot by 30-foot wall? How are we going to do this? There's no way. The only way it could happen is if God did it. And if God did it, he would have to have favor and he would be giving us such an amazing gift. Do you recognize how you treat the difference between something that's a gift and something you've earned? And as much as we tonight want to talk about our salvation is not earned, dear one, you treat it like you did earn it. You treat it like you earned it. Wake up and say, Did we really pause and say, I'd be in hell if it weren't for you. My life would be even more hell if it weren't for you. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of life, the gift of eyes, the gift of breath, the gift of salvation, the gift to live one more chance, one more day to see, one more sunset. Do we live this life? Do we spend the time in silence to recognize how blessed we are? Amen? How am I doing? Better than I deserve. Let me tell you, that's on the plate for every one of us every day. Be still and know that I am God, he says in Psalm 46.10. See, guys, are there any, do you see any parallels in tonight's story? And in our lives, I do. I find that so often when we have a victory over sin, if we begin to think that we had the victory over sin, we soon begin to have an indifference in our lives. We begin to finding ourselves getting into materialism and getting into paganism, meaning we start searching after the secular rather than the sacred. We start turning the cheap things into the precious, and the precious things cheap. 